welcome to our uh, mechanical engineering information session webinar that we have today. Uh, we have Kate Stockton, who is uh, from Maine, mechanical, aeronautical, and nuclear engineering. She's one of the uh, student support services um, administrators. I always forget the exact title, but she works over in student support uh, in Maine. Uh, so again, that includes mechanical, aeronautical, and nuclear engineering. But she'll be kind of going through what mechanical has to offer at Rensselaer, what the curriculum looks like, all those types of things. A couple disclaimers before we get started, and I pass it off to Kate. First things first, um, here in the Capital District of New York, we are right in the path of the tropical storm. So it, uh, the weather's starting to get a little crazy outside as I, I look out my window here. So if we lose connection or lose power, if Kate loses connection or power, I'll hop in. Hopefully, vice versa. Hopefully, we won't, but just a warning that we are in the path there. So crazy weather's on our way. Uh, second disclaimers, and I posted it in the chat here. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the chat. Um, with, um, with any questions that you may have about mechanical engineering admissions, so on and so forth, we're here to answer all of those questions. It is a moderated chat, so when a question is submitted, it won't automatically go into the chat window. We'll make sure I'm answering the one question at a time. Um, so at this point, I will pass it off to Kate. Okay, thank you. So once again, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about specifically the mechanical engineering program here at RPI. But as Greg mentioned, I do work for the main department. And um, as Greg also mentioned, that stands for mechanical aerospace or aeronautical and nuclear engineering. So if you guys have any questions about any of our majors, um, feel free to ask. Um, Sometimes I'm able to answer those questions during the webinar when we have a couple extra people on here. I will definitely answer all of the main related questions, the mechanical questions at the end. Um, and then if we uh, you know, need to talk about something else at the end, we will have Greg on here, any admissions questions. Um, and you know, just don't be afraid because you don't see your question. Um, don't worry about it, you know, just keep sending them and we'll address them all at the end. These webinars tend to be mostly questions, so we do want to hear from you. We want to hear what you have questions about as you're making your decisions on um, what colleges you're going to be applying to. And also, I just want to say, um, you know, I know this process is very different than anybody, any of your counselors can uh, you know, have experience, any of your older siblings, friends in, in older grades. Um, so, you know, we're all navigating this. So um, we really appreciate you navigating us with us and, you know, joining in in the webinar to, to learn more about RPI. So, um, so I am a student services administrator for the main department. So what that means is I help upperclassmen in the three majors that we have in Maine uh, navigate the requirements for their degree. So I am not a faculty member, but I do help students with all kinds of questions related to how they need to complete their degree, um, any processes they have on campus, if they wanna add a minor or a dual. Um, so I can you know, help you guys also if you have any questions about that. Um, so I work with our department so I work um, for our department head, he's my supervisor, and all faculty. So um, sometimes uh, like our student um, school of engineering hub, uh, they work with all of our freshmen, and then you kind of graduate to working with your faculty advisors. So, um, you know, I've, I work very closely with all the faculty too. So I just want to let you guys know that, you know, if you do have questions that, um, you're not sure, like I work, I answer questions about the, the curriculum all the time too, so ask away. So mechanical engineers, um, as you're starting to learn about the different disciplines in engineering, mechanical engineering is definitely one of the broadest fields of engineering. So they can work on things like automobiles, airplanes, spacecraft, power plants, air conditioning and heating systems, designing mechanisms, machines, forensic engineering, um, and manufacturing plants. And the disciplines include specific areas such as applied mechanics, including dynamics, mechanics of materials, computational mechanics, control systems, mechatronics, energy systems, uh, manufacturing and design. And we do have four concentrations under mechanical engineering. And 
concentrations in mechanical engineering are um, optional. So students um, can choose to do that, and that helps them kind of pick their classes later on in their curriculum. So mechanical engineering students, they have to complete 129 credits to, to complete their degree. And 22 of those are humanities and social sciences. So if you may, may have heard from other places like, you know, um, general education requirements and, and humanities classes. So all of our students take 22 credits of those. They also take 24 math and science courses, 15 core engineering courses. The core engineering courses are courses that many of our engineering students take. So they, um, you know, whether you're environmental engineering or biomed or mechanical, they share the classes with other engineering students. Uh, 56 of your credits are specific to mechanical engineering, and then 12 of your credits are free electives. So humanities and social sciences, a lot of times engineering students are curious, why do I have to take so many humanities classes and social science classes. And there is an importance to this. Um, it is really important for students to be well-rounded. You know, there's an expectation when you have a bachelor's degree that you have a certain knowledge set in different areas outside of your major. Um, but it's also very helpful for students in the engineering fields to have strong writing skills, to have strong uh, people skills, those soft skills. Um, so that's why it's a really important part of their curriculum. And we have, you know, we're a technical college, so we have, um, we know that, and our Haas classes many times reflect that. So we have classes where you're learning how to write, but the content may be about artificial intelligence. So, um, so it is more interesting for our students in the technical fields, um, the topics that you're learning about in those classes, but the skills are still there to kind of beef up those, those soft skills. Students all have to do a pathway in our HOSS. Um, and just to go back, HOSS stands for Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, so you do take classes in both areas. The pathways are designed for students to complete courses in um, both humanities and social sciences, but under an umbrella of a certain theme. So we have over 40 pathways. Um, it's on our website if you're ever interested to see what students can take for those. There's a lot of choices. Students can do an economics pathway or artificial intelligence pathway, um, sustainability pathway. So there are a lot of choices. Um, for students to kind of figure out where their niche is. Students also take professional development courses. Um, that is also part of their Haas requirements. And those classes really help students to kind of refine their, their, um, their work type skills. So either it's, you know, their interviewing skills or their resume skills, um, their public speaking skills, those types of things. So students all have that requirement into their curriculum as well. Students also have to take at least one communication intensive course. So these courses are uh, examined by our Haas department and they have to have a certain amount of writing in them, a certain level of writing, and then they get that designation of communication intensive um, where students are really getting those stronger writing skills, the research skills, um, so that we know our students are leaving RPI with those skills. All right, sorry, just making sure my volume is still good because I think I just leaned on my volume button. Um, and please don't hesitate if you if I start, um, somebody just let me know if you can't hear me or if I pause. All right, students also take 24 credits of math and science. This is pretty universal across our campus and all of our majors. Um, so mechanical students will take this as well. These classes are really important to build up those um, necessary skills and experience for our upper level uh, energy engineering courses. So um, it provides that foundational skill set for, um, 
things like uh, elements of mechanical design and, and other classes. Um, it improves students' problem solving and critical thinking skills, their research, research skills. Um, sometimes students will have AP or transfer credit that they can use towards these, and we get a lot of questions from students on whether or not they should use them, uh, meaning if I get credit for chemistry one, is it okay for me to use that or am I better off taking that class again at this college? Or for calculus one, should I retake calc one or should I just go right into calc two? So it's gonna depend on each student individually. You're gonna work really closely with a School of Engineering hub advisor when you're planning your uh, schedule for the fall that you start um, and they can answer those questions. Typically, we encourage students to take the credit and move on to the next class. So if it was for Calc, we would encourage you to take Calc 2, um, just because Calc 1 is still hard when you take it at RPI. So even if you've taken the course and gotten credit for it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the work is gonna be any easier. Um, you're still gonna have to do the work. So, um, you know, you're, most students are very successful when they go into Calc 2 with getting the AP credit. So we usually encourage students to do that. There could be exceptions, you know, if a student um, took the, the AP exam years ago, for some reason took a couple gap years, there could be exceptions like that for the, but for the most part, we encourage students to do that. All right, there are other math classes that aren't listed here that are part of our curriculum, but we kind of wrap those into the mechanical curriculum later on. Now again, core engineering classes, there's 15 credits of these. These are classes that are basic engineering classes. Um, students will sometimes take engineering classes in high school. Um, some have a very robust engineering curriculum in high school and other students don't. Some students don't have that option. There's, um, they have limited, more limited classes that they can take. So, you know, some students will spend more time in a class like engineering processes, which is only a one credit course, but it teaches students how to use certain machinery, um, certain basic building skills um, so that they have those foundational skills. And so in a class like that, for somebody who's never used those types of machines, they may need to go to lab hours a few more times than our students that have had that experience. But really the classes here are really meant to kind of even that playing field so that all of our students can be successful. Um, but all students have to complete all of these courses. So even if you do know the machines, you still have to go to class you know, when it's offered and you also have to complete the assignments. Um, so introduction to engineering analysis, um, things like CAD, um, a lot of times students know about you know, what, what CAD is even before they start college or you may have taken a, CLAD, a class in CAD, um, but they're all required classes when you come to RPI. And modeling an analysis of uncertainty, it's kind of like engineering statistics. So um, if you took a statistics course in high school, um, sometimes that can be helpful for you, but it's it's not usually something you get credit for, for to replace that class. So all of our students will take that class as well. And obviously we have our mechanical engineering classes. So these classes, this is where you're gonna spend a bulk of your credits, bulk of your time. You're mostly gonna start taking these classes either at the end of your sophomore year or once you're a junior, um, which actually would be during your summer arch. So this summer, um, all our rising juniors, they actually are juniors now because they're all taking their first semester of their junior year this summer. And they're taking classes like elements of mechanical design and um, fluid mechanics and a couple other uh, engineering type courses. Um, they'll take programming classes, control systems classes, and then there's some technical and computational electives where you have a certain amount of classes to choose from based on what your interests are. Students will also have free electives. So all majors on campus, there I go again, I'm kneeling or I'm putting my elbows on my volume button. So I have to be very careful with that. <laughs> um, all of our students on campus, they will have a certain amount of free electives, but it varies depending on their major. So mechanical has 12 credits. Um, our aero major, at least under Maine, aero has the least amount of uh, free electives, but 
mechanical students have 12. Um, we have sometimes students that do the aero mech dual. And in that case, and pretty much many cases when you're doing a dual degree, that means that you won't have free electives, so to speak, um, where you can just choose anything. Usually the dual means that you're taking those free electives in the other major. It's where you can kind of overlap both degrees. But students um, really do have the freedom if you're just if you're doing the straight mechanical degree to choose those 12 credits in any discipline on campus. And when I'm advising students and they're kind of unsure about where they want to use the, these credits, first of all, we always check because sometimes students have AP credit that's not used for their Haas or their math and science. And those can count in their free electives. So we always see what was used up there. Um, students can definitely take more Haas classes. Um, so if you take, like I said, like um, maybe a psychology course or game design course and you really enjoyed that, you may want to take more. Um, you could always use those for your free electives. Students can take a management class or a couple um, for their free electives. Management only counts for a mechanical in their free electives. So it doesn't, like I showed before, there's the Haas requirements and the math and science requirements, but there's no management requirements for our students. So if they want to take a management course, that would have to count as a free elective. And, and we do have plenty of students who do that. Um, so that's definitely an option. It's a good option for a lot of students. Also, you could do your mechanical concentration, and those could uh, be your courses for that. And then sometimes students will do our undergraduate research. And if anybody wants to know more about research, if you have a specific question, just put it in the comment or the question box. Um, our undergraduate research program is really great at RPI because we have a lot of undergraduates doing it early on. Um, so. At other colleges, usually, you know, if undergraduates are doing research, it's not until their senior year um, or not until they're uh, in grad school sometimes. And our program is very robust. Our faculty use students as early as freshman year on certain things. So students have to approach faculty if they're interested in doing that, and then they fill out an application. So it's not a application process where you get picked. Um, but if you're interested, you approach the faculty and if they have room, if they have um, a project that is appropriate for freshman or sophomore, whatever level you're at, um, and you have the skills that they need, or maybe they have a project where you need very few incoming skills, um, then they will encourage you to fill out an application and then students can use that for uh, credits or sometimes they can get paid for that as well. So there's that option too. And the other thing that is really strong at RPI is our student clubs and specifically our academic clubs. And for mechanical students, we have a lot. We have a lot of clubs that students can get involved in that really help students kind of get their feet wet in the industry even before you know they graduate even as early like I said as freshman year um, so I would definitely encourage you to take a look at our student club website you can get an idea of the kinds of clubs that we have um, you know some of the popular ones we have um, motorsports we have um, the rocket club which you see there rockets Rocket Society. Um, we have a lot of um, honor societies and um, design, build, fly. And a lot of our clubs, you know, you can be any major to join. Even something, you know, I know most of you are interested in, in probably at least engineering, if not mechanical. But some of our clubs that you would think are mostly meant for, you know, mechanical or aero students actually use a lot of students from management and um, Haas. So they can kind of, um, you know, those students are kind of more in charge of the marketing and, you know, the, the publicity and that sort of thing. So, you know, it is something that's open to all students and I think the students really enjoy it. I know that on the admissions YouTube channel, there's a couple webinars that some of our student clubs did. So again, I'd encourage you if you want to learn more about those to check that out um, because the students did a really good job in 
kind of talking about and highlighting their clubs. Um, the admissions uh, Instagram account also has a lot of clubs that jump on there and take over for the day. Um, so also check that out and follow them if you're on Instagram because a lot of times it's, it's really good for students to kind of hear from other students. So I'd encourage you to do that. So um, that's pretty much it for my presentation. I wanted to leave a lot of room for questions. Um, if there's anything I breezed over too quickly, just let me know. And I've been seeing the questions pop up. So, yay. <laughs> We got a lot, Kate, as per usual for mechanical sure. and uh, and uh, main uh, webinars. Um, so sure. we'll get started here. I've answered a bunch in the chat already. We're going to just do the rest um, out loud because it makes it a little bit easier. Um, are research are any are there any research uh, or internship opportunities? Can they be used as a part time job? I know you talked about it a little bit. I think the question came in before. Um, Okay, yes. that, but, so uh, for research, students can choose to do that either for credit or for money, um, for paid. Um, they Usually it's kind of up to the faculty. If the faculty have the funds to provide the paid uh, positions, then they will let the students know and then the students can choose if they want to do that or if they want to get the credits. It, it usually kind of depends on how it fits in with their degree what the kinds of courses they already took, if they have room for that. Um, but if the, if the faculty don't have the funds, then the students can still get the credit for it. And then the internship, was that mixed in with the internship? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I so if you want to keep going on research, because this student, at, and then we'll hit internships next. Um, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not exclusive for people with just free elective credit. They can do it for uh, right. pay as well. Yes. So again, it, yeah. you can't do it for free necessarily. Um, they don't let labor laws are, uh, don't allow us to do to have you just show up in the lab and mm -hmm. work for either no money or no credit. Um, so you <laughs> can do it for those two. I, you know, ca cash or credit, as I always say. Um, so, and then we had another question about internships. Um, what kind of internships are available for students? Um, sure. Where are they going? So, you can kind of um, talk a little bit about those. There next. are, we have a lot, and I think it's really helpful if you look at our CCPD, which stands for our Center for Career and Professional Development um, Department. If you go on there, they have hiring statistics, and that includes co-op information and hiring like for employment afterwards. So students can see, and it's all broken down by major, where our mechanical students go for co-ops. Um, internships, co-ops, are they are different, but the, the companies that our students go to kind of are, are, covers both, and also for employment. So I'd encourage students to go there, first of all. I'll try to grab the link and put it in the chat box. Um, and also, um, they're all ongoing. So sometimes that list grows based on students that have uh, friends and family that work in different companies. But our CCBD office works really hard to help students create those relationships too and to keep those strong and, and going. So we have a whole team and in that office that's dedicated to, to working with employers, another set of people that are working with students. So they really are working hard to get those um, opportunities for our students. It's still up to the student to do the legwork because it's still important that you have control over that process, that you have a say in where you're going. So nobody gets assigned an internship or a co-op, but everybody has to have an away experience while they're at RPI. So um, most students want that to be an internship or co-op, and there are a lot of resources and opportunities, but the students do have to have a really strong part of that process. Um, so yeah. And the types of places, if you, I think probably the link is just the best place for students Wonderful. to see where our students go. Yeah. 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 I mean, students are going all over the country um, for internships and co-op opportunities. Um, so this is a question. Um, can some of the free elective credits be used towards engineering Definitely. classes yes. to go more in depth? So on a particular um, topic? like I mentioned, we do have concentration. So if students are really interested in manufacturing, they can take manufacturing classes for their technical electives. And then if they want to keep taking them, they can take more for their free electives. And, and same thing for like dynamics classes, robotics classes, that sort of thing. Awesome. 
Um, so this one is, how is campus life? Are you required to dorm? How are the dorms? So on, um, campus facilities, campus activities. So uh, in the chat, I put a link to all of the clubs and organizations. Someone already asked that. So I would recommend taking a look there. We have over 200 clubs and organizations on campus to get involved with. Um, when it comes to residential life and things like that, students are required to live on campus their freshman year, sophomore year, and then the summer of the ARCH program besides this year because we're doing it virtually for obvious reasons. Um, so that would be there. Um, and then I would also recommend, if you wanna get a real student perspective, um, I would recommend Asador. Asador. Let me spell that right. Um, I'm gonna put our student ambassador email in the chat. Um, so if you have any specific questions about being a student on campus, that's regularly checked throughout the day by uh, six or eight of our student ambassadors. That's a really great chance to ask those nope. questions. Mm -mm. I didn't go to RPI. Kate, you didn't go to RPI, correct? Nope. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have our yeah. nuclear professor who did the nuclear session uh, last week, who has been at RPI for 16 years for undergrad, grad, and now he's a professor. So um, I, that's where I recommend to talk to about the real RPI experiences. Um, another one, could you apply AP test courses like U.S. history and language so, composition? Yes, for yes, students your do that. Um, so they come in usually as SDS or SDSH credits and then uh, you work with your advisor to make sure you know, understand how they apply and then what's left to complete. Um, all right, with 2021 being test optional, uh, does not submitting test course affect students' chances of merit-based scholarship consideration? No, it does not. Um, it will not affect merit. It will not affect your application, status, process, acceptance. W being optional means optional. It's kind of like sending... Um, the subject tests that were optional for all of our programs besides the accelerated medical program. So if it, you send it, it would only benefit your application because we can't compare you against everybody else. Um, so again, we're going test optional for this application cycle. So for fall 2021, spring 2022, and then after that, we're going to reassess and reevaluate um, for the next upcoming year. Um, what is RPI best known for? What makes it unique? I'll answer that one to start. And Kate, if you want to add stuff, feel free. Uh, we're the oldest technical university in the country. We're almost 200 years old. Those students that are starting their freshman year this fall um, are going to start out uniquely because they'll because it'll it's during the middle of a pandemic, but they'll also be graduating in our 200th year, um, which I think is a really cool idea. Um, so that's kind of that's what we're known for. We're, we're known for STEM, um, and one thing that I think that I always gets highlighted by our faculty is that we're an undergraduate, primarily undergraduate institution, but still also a research institution. So there's a lot of opportunities for students to get involved in research with faculty um, and be published and all that good stuff. So that's one thing that makes us a little bit more unique. Um, maybe a larger state school where you know you have 30,000 total students and the faculty are really only working with their grad students for research. We being only about 6,600 undergrad students, you really have that ability to get in, um, so uh, involved there. So the one thing that there. usually comes uh, up when, you have anything to add to that? you know, we're doing these kinds of webinars with students and with faculty is that um, our students really feel like we're uh, the, the the campus and the classrooms are very collaborative as opposed to competitive so you're not fighting for grades you're working together to get the best grades as a group um, because as I learn the material better and help you with it I'm getting better so that's the kind of the mentality of our students which a lot of students appreciate because it is a tough school it's a rigorous place to be you know, students are, you know, they're smart when they get here, but they learn really quickly that they got to work hard too. And some of them come in here as hard workers and other ones quickly realize that, um, you know, maybe grades came pretty easy, easy to them in high school and now they have to work a little harder, but there's a lot of resources, a lot of support for students to do that, to be successful. Um, so I think that's one thing that definitely stands out. And then on the other end, when they leave here, employers know RPI students as hard workers and they really know their stuff. So, um, so I think that's another thing to keep in mind. 
Yeah, and that actually leads right into the next question. Is uh, what? It, how do you? How would you describe a mechanical engineering student at RPI? So I think you hit that a little bit. That we really do have that cooperative learning environment more than a competitive. But if you could kind of talk about some of the student experiences, sure. Or type, yeah. Type of um, students that so you I would have to say that you know I've worked at other colleges, and I have to say that RPI students are some of the nicest students that I've ever worked with. I was worried about coming here because the other places I worked, um, students, you know, it was a community college or something, and um, you know. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be surrounded by all this, you know, smart students. I don't know if I get a question wrong. They're going to challenge me. No, they are some of the nicest students. They really care about the details and they are very patient, but they also are appreciative um, for the information too. So um, honestly, the students, especially mechanical, anybody in Maine, uh, the students have just been a joy to work with. Um, and I, I know that probably sounds like I'm just say nice things about the students, but I really do enjoy working with them. Um, they really are true to who they are when they are at RPI. I feel I feel like the students who end up at RPI are very, um, they're, they're very happy to be who they are. They, they don't feel, I don't know, I, I probably can't articulate that well, but they really have found a home for the most part, I think. Yep. Other. <laughs> yeah. One of our student ambassadors always said, yeah, one of our student ambassadors has always said that every student at RPI <laughs> lands way. somewhere on the nerd spectrum, and I think that's the best way. And so, if you, you know, so for so for students who, you know, you you have that that click at mm -hmm. your school, um, everyone is in that click at at RPI because we're because that's just the type of student that we that we tend to attract. Um, so, so it's that's question, just uh, going to be very class dependent on mechanical? you know if you're a freshman or a junior. Um, I would say as a freshman, your average class size may be closer to 100, just depending on what you're taking. But, you know, a chemistry class or a calculus class might be a little bit bigger, um, but usually have a smaller component to that where you're working with either the TAs or, you know, going to uh, a recitation with the faculty that's a smaller group. And, um, when you get to junior year, there are some classes that are shared by other majors or just by all mechanical students. So those can be a little bit higher, closer to 100. But then there's other classes that are specific to what your interests are, like those technical electives. Um, the lab classes are obviously very small. Um, so those can be like 10 people in a lab or 20 people in a um, like a mechanical behavior of materials class. It's a very specific class that only those students are interested in taking. Um, so it just, it, there is a range, um, but I think the smallest class we, we have, sometimes we run classes that are only five students in a nuclear class because it's a required class, it has to run. Um, and then some of them get up a little bit higher than a hundred. Um, um, are there any study abroad opportunities at RPI? And the simple answer is yes. Uh, um, so I don't know if, Kate, if you want to go into a little bit more of the detail. Sure, about it. yeah. The, not, I, I can for talk a mechanical a bit more student, there's kind of two ways to do that for, um, in terms of, you know, how do you do it during your time at RPI? Um, because when I'm working with students, usually they're trying to figure out how it works with their classes. So the one way you can do it is part of your away experience where you're, you, you, um, work with our study abroad programs. There are affiliated and unaffiliated programs. Um, so you know, there's different, the one, it just basically is more of a seamless uh, process. The other one, you might find a, a program through some other college. So it's a little bit more of, a little bit more red tape that you have to go through, but you can still get the credits that transfer back. So for those, you would think about that as a semester where you're actually not, um, it's not built in that you're taking credits, but you would be taking them because you'd be doing study abroad. So you could take classes, basically anything you wanna take and anything can come back and either count towards your degree or not, depending on how you know your credits fall in. And then the other way that you can do it is during one of your semesters, um, you can take required classes that you would need. Here, let me, maybe I can use this as a visual. I know this is hard to read, but I'm just gonna use it for um, visual purposes. So that away semester, if you're looking at the third year, you see the arch summer, it's kind of like that third year for a semester. Um, that is your summer classes. And then there's only one other semester because the other fall or spring, 
you are away and that you could do study abroad and then take a couple classes if you want. The other way you could do it is you could do it where you're doing your fall or spring class load abroad. Um, it gets a little more tricky because you'd have to find those specific classes that are offered somewhere or you'd have to shift things around, but that's part of my job is to help students do that. And then we would usually recommend that you not take a full load um, just because you want to enjoy where you are. So you might kind of wait on that class and take that in your senior year or something. Yeah, and some popular ones are a Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen. Uh, there's a, a technical school in Singapore, the technical school in Australia. So you can go and take those engineering mm -hmm. courses elsewhere. You don't have to tell you have to save your humanities electives or things like that. You can still take those technical courses elsewhere. Uh, so there's a lot of good opportunities. We got a question, another question before um, we answered that one. Um, are there other are the other engineering majors also, do they also have 129 credits? I think they uh, all range. Um, I majors? really only work with our main students. So if somebody somebody asked me the, the other day how many are in the electrical engineering, and I really couldn't honestly answer that without looking it up. I mean, it's all in our catalog. It's all there, and it depends on your class year, too. So we have, currently, we have students that are completing their degree from, that have, that kind of took a couple breaks here and there, and they only require uh, 128 to graduate. And that's just based on the year you start the college and what the catalog said that year. So um, yeah, it's gonna vary just between a couple credits here and there. Although I think some of the science and maybe Haas are even a little bit lower, but Greg, you might know that better. Yeah. I th I, I've seen anywhere between about 124 and 132, I think, might be the high end, and I don't remember which one that is. But it's all basically – it. credit hours is just kind of the, the amount of hours you're spending in the class per week. So many of our courses are four credit hours. So you're – so again, you're taking four, four credit courses a semester for about 16 credits total. Again, that does vary, but – um, that's kind of what you should expect, and that will allow you to graduate in those four years. Um, will my experience with FIRST Robotics competition help me in mechanical engineering field? When it comes to the admissions process, it is part of the extracurriculars, and we kind of look at those. We're not looking for anything specific for by major, but it'll definitely, you know, being involved in general helps the application, absolutely. Um, and I always say it, it prepares you a little bit for what to, what you're going to learn in the classroom, but we don't expect you to know anything when you get here. Um, it's our job to teach you. Oh, your, no, your and I would just say uh, you might be a good asset for a little some bit more. of our clubs, which, you know, that doesn't may not sound as important as getting into a college, but in the long run, mm -hmm. if you start off you know, as a freshman, as having skill sets that other students don't have, just imagine how far you'll be when you get to be a senior. You know, you could be the person in charge of the club, which is really great for a resume. Absolutely. Uh, what kind of opportunities are available for students who want to study robotics? Are there certain courses that you would recommend to take? So on and so forth. So I've I've gotten this question asked many times over the last two weeks okay. in the many webinars I've done. Um, so I'm going to answer this one because uh, it, it all depends on the type of robotics you want to go into. If you're more into the getting the robot moving and doing something that it's supposed to do, like functionally doing something, the mechanical engineering is the right program for you. If you want to get more into the programming side, then it's computer science. There's also people in computer systems and electrical engineering. There's kind of robotics people in all of those different departments. Um, so it really depends on you. You can do robotics in almost any department on mm -hmm. campus, but it really depends on what you want to be a part of as a uh, as someone Covered involved it. in robots mm -hmm. um so yes is the, is the answer yes there's there's robotics at rpi um and those usually again will be done in those um uh, either your particular major um as kind of a concentration i know in electrical and computer systems there's concentrations in those robotics areas or in those um uh, kind yeah. of the what did you what do you call them with the tech yeah not the concentrations the, um, yep. the uh technical electives there it is Technical electives, where you're taking major, you know, courses outside yeah. of your major, but still in um, engineering. Yeah. Um, 
Does RPI have an, a student orchestra? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's in the list of clubs, so you can take a look at the list of clubs. I forget the exact name of it. But yes, we do have a full orchestra. There's a ton of different musical organizations on campus. Uh, we have a couple of questions here about the city surrounding RPI. Uh, where was the other one? I'm not familiar with Troy. Uh, perfect. So, so kind of a little bit about Troy. Troy is a small city, about 50,000 residents within the city limits of Troy. We're right on the Hudson River. The city of Troy is on the Hudson River, about 10 to 15 minutes north and across the Hudson. So we're on the east side of the Hudson River um, from Albany. Um, Troy, back in the Industrial Revolution, is one of the 10 wealthiest cities in America, nicknamed the Collar City. Uncle Sam is from Troy. Um, it's really gone through quite a renaissance in the last 15 or so years. A lot of great restaurants opening up, shops, great farmer's market, musical groups, all that good stuff. It's a really nice, tight community, really easily walkable. We're on top of a hill overlooking downtown Troy and the Hudson River, so it's a really great views as well. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about Troy. Uh, our virtual tour does go into Troy a little bit, um, so I do recommend taking a look uh, on our virtual tour as well uh, mm -hmm. on the admissions page. Okay, do you have any, you've worked in Troy. Oh, uh, yeah, no, uh, I mean, it years. is a city. Any... So I know, I, you know, I've, I've had students that um, come from, you know, big cities and they think it's not a city because it's a, you know, smaller city and it's pretty easy to navigate. And then I've had students that have come, you know, they come from rural areas and it's totally a new experience for them. So it's kind of a nice happy medium and, and the capital district as a whole has a lot going on and there's a lot of places, even, you know, big cities that are pretty close and easy to, to get to. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Again, you're in the capital district, so Albany's only about 15 minutes away. The state capitol building, all the great things that Albany has to offer. Saratoga and Schenectady are about 30 minutes away. Um, and I always say, from campus, you're always about 45 minutes from the middle of nowhere in any direction. So if you're an outdoorsy person, you want to go hiking, kayaking, whatever. It's really easily accessible to go ahead yes. skiing. If you want to get lost in the woods, there's plenty of woods to get lost in. Um, so. Um, what was the next one? Uh, how and when do you decide whether you want to be an aeronautical engineer? Um, so I've, I've said this a few times uh, in the chat, but mm -hmm. it, you have to pick your major by the end of your third semester. So mm -hmm. halfway through the sophomore, you have to pick your major. You can mm -hmm. change after that, but then there's no guarantee you're going to finish in four years. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the short answer. Uh, I have a couple of questions about this. Um, do Can mm -hmm. students double major, we call it dual majoring with a minor. Uh, the short answer is mm -hmm. yes. The, the a longer answer is should you? Or the question I would respond is should you? Um, mm -hmm. Some majors make more sense to dual together. Mm -hmm. Like Kate said before, aero and mechanical, those fit nicely together. Computer systems and electrical engineering, computer systems engineering and computer science, those work well together. Mechanical engineering and music, mm -hmm might not work the best together. So it might be better just to get a minor. So, um, okay, you, yeah, talk, you, you advise try to students, really if you want to the talk a little bit more about that. do the dual um, and then figure out if there's a different way that they can still get the same experiences. Um, just having the dual on your degree, on your diploma is not really enough to do much for you. You want to have a good story with that, a good reason for that. Because, you know, fa um, employers, like if they see, oh, you were a dual major, tell me more about that. You want to have a good reason why you did that. Because some might be a little hesitant thinking that it's too watered down curriculum. And it's not, at RPI at least, it's it's not, you still have to complete all the requirements for both degrees, but you want to be able to articulate why you did that. And um, for the example that Greg gave, if you did mechanical and music, um, I'm sure there could be a great story that goes along with that. And it may have absolutely nothing to do with mechanical engineering, and that's okay because everybody's a person and everybody has interests. And employers want to know they're hiring somebody that is going to be, you know, they're going to be sitting next to their, their other employees and somebody, you know, you want to have good things to talk about. They're hiring people too. So, you know, keep that in mind. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure what, about what, what he means by this question. I don't know if you said this but honors before, but what is the difference between minor and honors? I'm not sure. Um, we 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 don't have honors, an honors college or anything like that. And a minor is just a, is a, a usually a small number of courses than a major, usually about four to six courses, um, and it's in a particular area. So students can major in mechanical engineering and minor in a 
almost anything on campus because those fit nicely into either free electic, free electives, Haas electives, so on and so forth. So I'm not sure what you mean by uh, honors because we don't we don't have an honors college or anything like that. There's no honor um, honor stuff like that. Um, this is a we'll do this one and then we'll I'll follow up or give you the general one that we'll follow specifically for um, main and mechanical. Um, how does RPI uh, look during these uncertain times, especially if the pandemic lasts longer than expected? Um, so the plan right now is we're going to have the freshmen on campus, the juniors on campus and the seniors on campus for the fall. Sophomores will do 100 percent virtual. We're going to do a lot of uh, hybrid learning where half the class is in the class half the week and the other half and that, that other half of the class is doing it virtually that week or that day. So it's going to be a combination uh, when it comes to learning. I know Kate can go into that a little bit more. Um, and then we're going to see where we are in the spring. Um, you know, if it goes longer, I expect that we will again, continue to socially distance and the, it'll probably be the juniors off campus because they'll be doing their away semesters in the spring um, and then the sophomores on campus. So they'll kind of trade out and the seniors and freshmen mm -hmm. will stay all year. It was probably the plan, but again, yeah. the plan's changed about a dozen times this summer. Um, and so the, the other one is, uh, the, the next one again, more specifically towards Maine is how is the pandemic affected um, Maine so uh, or mechanical us, in general? The biggest difference was that all of our juniors, typically our juniors split between being here in the fall and being here in the spring. So our that's this is kind of a very specific answer because I help organize all the students and get them help for registering for classes. So about half of them are registering typically in the spring and then the fall. Um, but for this semester, all the juniors are going to be here for classes in the fall. So it's basically the demand for main classes has gone up 50% for the fall. So that has made things a little bit uh, more tight in terms of the class sizes for this fall. But that hopefully is just a one-time thing. Um, and that's what we're seeing. And that um, I know a lot of our faculty have been involved in a lot of things related to COVID and COVID research and COVID um, assistance. And, you know, so I think that has definitely been something. And some of our students have done projects on COVID related um, solutions. So that has been another thing that students that has changed based on the, you know, the pandemic. So it's, you know, it's where or a technical institution. So we have a lot of people who are very knowledgeable and very interested in trying to solve problems. So, um, so we're part of the solution, hopefully. And the rest of us that are trying to make things work, we're, we're doing everything we can to make it work. Yeah. Next question is about, um, since I'm very interested in the automotive side of mechanical engineering, what are some of the programs or opportunities that are available? Um, so I know you talked about the automotive, yep. the, the various motorsports teams that so we have. So the um, students that are interested in automotive, to be honest, most of them will flock to those student groups. Um, motorsports is the most popular, but we do have a hybrid um, uh, car club as well. Um, I think there's another one too. It's the name escapes me right now, but um, there you go. There's a, it, it, it's That's gas, right. hybrid, That's and right. electrical. Yeah. There's, there's three different yeah, ones. So yeah, so I, I think don't a lot of those students name, will go to it's... one of those clubs and, and um, really they'll use the knowledge and, and skills they learn in their classes and apply it to those clubs. So they're actually putting those skills to use. And then if they don't have those skills yet, they may actually learn about it from upperclassmen in the club before they actually take the class. So um, <clears throat> we do have some classes that would be more helpful for students in those clubs, something like um, mechatronics, or you know, they may suggest a student take a, a electrical engineering course or a manufacturing course, depending on what part of automotive you're interested in. So um, that again, once you, the other, actually the one thing I didn't even talk about was that students get uh, a faculty advisor once they're sophomores. So they work with our School of Engineering hubs, which are professional advisors like myself, because freshmen usually need more of the um, registration help um, processes, like how do I do this? Basically, how do I get my classes and, and get started? And then once you're done with freshman year, you get a faculty advisor. And the faculty advisor plays the role of really mentoring the students in the field. So those are the kinds of conversations that students have with the faculty advisor, like, what what part of mechanical engineering do you want to go into? And then the faculty have more of an expertise in the field and they can help connect the students with those 
those classes or those opportunities. And then I, a couple of questions here um, about this one. The first one's about student athletes and if they're at a disadvantage. And then the other one uh, is about ROTC. So if you can kind of, for those students who are involved in those, mm -hmm. not even necessarily those co-curricular uh, experiences, could you talk a little bit about sure, how they Sure, yeah. Um, um, I always think about mechanical. this one student that I worked with. He was a transfer student from another college. And, and he, I think... The expectation at the other college was that the engineering students had to be accommodated. At RPI, everybody's kind of in the same boat. I mean, the athletes do get preferential scheduling, so they get to register for their classes a little earlier from, from other people. But academics really seem to, to come first to almost, you know, I don't really run into a lot of coaches that are pushy about students not taking courses at certain times. Everybody works around the class schedule. That's the most important thing. Um, <clears throat> students don't have, seem to have any issues figuring out when they can take their classes based on what season they're in. Every single semester is going to have classes that are going to be demanding. So there's no way to push one off to or put, make one semester lighter than the other, really, unless you're really going to punish yourself later on or spend another semester. So um, for the most part, it doesn't really affect the students in any way that's different than our other students. Um, the ROTC students, and I don't know if I could say most, but some of our ath athletes don't do the ARCH, so they don't take classes over the summer they get an exception. And the reason for that is because they're kind of getting these away experiences through their sports or through ROTC. So it kind of, it, it's already built into what they're doing. Um, but that just means that those students are here for a full fall and spring schedule for their junior year. Um, I don't really think anything else is different for them. Um, they don't get any extra privileges other than that registration. And um, they don't really get a disadvantage from what I understand. A lot of our student athletes tend to be the best students just because they have to be really good about time management. And that, that's one thing we hear from, I hear from advisors, from faculty, is that the student athletes tend to be the more organized students, because you have to be, um, mm -hmm. because you're, you're doing all of those things. Same thing with ROTC, because you're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're usually up at six o'clock in the morning for PT or drill or whatever you may be doing. And again, the ROTC students are going to answer this in the chat, but the ROTC students, no matter what branch you're doing, um, Air Force, Navy, Army, you don't do the arch because the summer is is full, or sometimes the military science courses aren't offered in the summer. So there's reasons why, um, like Kate was talking about. Um, what is the student to faculty ratio? Uh, I don't in really mechanical? know if I have an answer to that. Unfortunately, I might have to get back to you guys on that. <laughs> Send me an email. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the average is across the institution is thirteen to one. That's the student to faculty ratio across the institution. Yeah. Mechanical uh, is probably a little bit bigger than that because here. it's the second um, largest I can major find on campus. Out anything and get uh, back to you guys. Anybody who. Uh, as a, yeah, as a student in mechanical engineering, can I take classes in architecture? Yes, you have those free elective credits. So you absolutely can. Um, you know, you can't. You can't. That, that would be one that would pretty much. Aaron, the architecture major the bachelor's of architecture is probably the only major mm -hmm. on campus that's impossible to duel with anything that makes any sense because it is so specific and it is a professional degree um uh, what is what's the average amount of credits a student a mechanical student takes in two semesters so kind of talk in the freshman year how many <laughs> yeah. um well you yeah. can see it on the it is on the 17 chart here. and 17 it's very, and again very that's going to totally um, depend on if you're bringing in any any ap courses or transfer credits um, AP credits or transfer credits. And if so, if you're able to kind of progress to the next class, you may still have 17 and 17 is going to be around that. All right. A uh, couple of questions about financial aid. Um, so any student who applies to Rensselaer is automatically eligible for merit-based scholarships based on their admissions application. So the merits based on, you know, grades. Um, previously, it was test scores. So I'm used to saying test scores. So I, I'll say it just to get it off of my brain. So I don't sound like I don't think I'm forgetting something. But your grades, your extracurriculars, everything we evaluate in the admissions process will get handed over to financial aid for merit-based scholarship. 
need-based aid is based on the FAFSA and the CSS profile. We do require both documents for need-based aid. But the merit aid, we don't require those forms. I do recommend filling out those forms, even if you don't think you're going to receive need-based aid, because who knows, you might you might want to use the federal loans because they tend to have lower interest rates than the private loans. Um, so in 100% of our U.S. students, U.S. domestic students, receive some form of aid, merit, need, or both. Um, is there an advantage to doing the Canvas Choice application over the Common App? There's no advantage when it comes to the review process. We review all applications the same. The only advantage is, is that the, the Canvas Choice application tends to be a little bit faster. That's literally it uh, because some of the information is already filled out. Whatever we have and we, when you've sent the Canvas Choice application to you, um, that information is already filled out. Um, if you, the, that being said, if you go to a school that uses Naviance, we do strongly recommend they use the Common App because it makes your guidance counselor's life a lot easier sending us documents. Um, are, are certain majors more competitive to get into than others, or do students always end up with their choice? So when we're reviewing an application, we're always reviewing the application for the major that you've applied for. So when you apply to RPA, you can either apply to a specific major, mechanical engineering, biology, chemistry, whatever. You can apply to a specific school undeclared, so mechanical engineering, um, air not, or excuse me, un, uh, engineering undeclared, science undeclared, business undeclared, so on and so forth. And then you have that time to explore, um, which is one thing I forgot to bring up from the chat earlier, I said that we would talk about it later, um, is that exploring part uh, within the School of Engineering, uh, or you can come in undeclared. So I always say apply to the program that makes the most sense for you. If you know you want to be an engineer, but you're not sure the discipline, apply undeclared engineering. If you know you want to be in aeronautical engineering or mechanical engineering, apply to those specific programs because we get you into your major into your in your first semester at RPI. We don't wait until your, until your junior year to start taking major courses. You start taking major courses right away. But that was one thing I'm glad I, I remembered. Uh, <laughs> student asked about exploring different majors and in engineering. Could you talk a sure. little bit about some of those, you know, the intro yeah. courses and so, those other things? Like I said, students all students explore. get a School of Engineering hub advisor their first year. The hub advisors are split between all of the engineering majors. So, for example, um, Marie Diefenbach, she works with all of our aero and nuclear students in their freshman year. And then Karen Lewis works with all of the um, mechanical students. But they also know all the other curriculum for all the other engineering because they're a hub. They're all there to kind of help students in any of the engineering fields. So um, they really do work with students based to find if that's the right fit for them, if that's their interest, um, if maybe they want to take another intro course. So maybe they're um, <clears throat> an electrical engineering student but wants to take a class in um I can't say mechanical because we don't have an introduction to mechanical engineering, but we do have one for um, for nuclear. So, and then there's a fundamentals of flight for aero students. There is an introduction to better world engineering that is available to all students, but is required for all of our undecided engineering students. And that class is really built to kind of show all of the engineering fields. They have faculty each week from different disciplines, students, um, alumni that come and talk, and then there's usually a mingling component afterwards. Last year it was in the student lounge. This year it will probably be virtual, but um, but it'll be a chance for students to kind of um, really find out the ins and outs of all the different curriculum before they have to make that decision. Um, many of our other engineering disciplines have the introduction class that's only a one credit class so a student can kind of take that and kind of figure out if that's the right fit for them we don't have that for mechanical um, but there are ways and definitely opportunities for students to connect with faculty and and different staff to kind of explore that Yeah, and, and again, that, that, that course you're talking about that it has yes. all of the engineering programs, that's, again, like you said, available for everyone. So even if you're a mechanical engineering, you know, you're our first semester freshman in mechanical mm -hmm. engineering, and you're like, I think I don't want to do mechanical, you can always take that mm -hmm. course and say, okay, I actually mm -hmm. know I, you know, nuclear engineering or yep. industrial and systems engineering really fits with me. So um, it's a really great opportunity. Um, and to, off of that question, um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, if you uh, if you get in undeclared, you're not there's no you're not at a disadvantage. There's no setbacks because you're taking 
all the same. I would actually that say first, you kind of have year, more right? resources available to you because there's more of an investment that we help you find out what is your interest. So like I mentioned, if you come in as an undeclared engineering student, you're automatically put in that class. So because we know it's important for you to figure out what you want to do. Um, even our undecided students, they get a special advisor that helps students really figure out what they want to do. So if you, you know, if you're really undecided, you should apply undecided because then we'll be able to provide the right resources and opportunities for you. If you are undecided and you think there's like a 1% chance you might do arrow, I would encourage you to do undecided. But um, if, you know, anybody can take advantage of the resources, but, you know, we try to match students and help students. So that's why it's important for you to apply. There's no other real advantage to picking a major other than what you're interested in. Uh, all right, and we have one last question here. Uh, do students on average partake in many clubs or just a few? Um, is there uh, not a lot of time to do as many clubs? Uh, I can, I, again, I, during the spring while we were uh, doing kind of the, the get, you know, the recruiting the class to come in in the fall, um, I listened to a lot of student opportunity or student mm -hmm. clubs and things like that. Um, and it really varies on the student. There are many students that'll do four or five different clubs and have a variety of different involvement in them. Some clubs require more time than others. And then there are some students who um, say, I'm going to be 100%, put all of my club energy into the motorsports team or into the rocketry team or into the coding club or so on and so forth. So it really depends on the student. Um, and it really depends on your time management ability, really. Mm -hmm. um, if you're better at time management, you could probably fit more clubs in. Um, it, so, yeah, and I think that would be a my, lot of students my, look at my it as a win-win, especially when they're doing the academic clubs, because not only are they, you know, engaging in a club and getting that to put on their resume, but they're also, you know, usually in a club with other people in their major. They're in with upperclassmen from their major, so they're getting to know a little bit more about, you know, what faculty they should take classes from or which ones maybe not to take classes from, um, but just you know, it's kind of a nice way to, to get those connections. You know, they, they stay friends after they graduate. I think um, <clears throat> it's just a, it's a good way to kind of, you know, help yourself out, but also have fun at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not seeing yep. any more questions coming in. I put my email in there. Uh, I know Kate put her email in there as well. Um, so if you have any further questions, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, I'll get you the answer. Kate will get you the answer um, that you're looking for. Um, so, or if you didn't feel comfortable asking your question in the chat, feel free to email us. We can answer those on a more individual basis. Um, so uh, at this point, again, I'm still not seeing any questions roll in. So Kate, thank you for uh giving us a lot of great information about mechanics. Thanks for having me and, and thanks for attending everybody. Hope to see you in the fall. Next fall. <laughs> yeah, absolutely.